Art. Perfect. Um, well, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alicia Garrig. I am the development manager here at Christine Ann Domestic Abuse Services. Um, and I'm very grateful to be here with you all today. And um, so today we're going to be talking about healthy versus unhealthy relationships. And I am going to pull up my presentation. All right. So um, throughout the presentation today, if you come across any sort of questions that you may have on content that I'm going over, just pop them in the chat and um, I'll answer any questions at the end and, and then also save time for um, any comments, concerns, anything like that. So, um, but feel free as we're going through just to um, pop in your questions and then I will try to answer all of those at the end. Uh, so yeah, again, we're gonna be talking about healthy versus unhealthy relationships. Um, but before we do that, I'm just going to touch very briefly on the organization that I work for, which is Christine Ann Domestic Abuse Services. Um, we are a nonprofit agency that serves all individuals and families um, who are impacted by domestic abuse. So our primary service area is Winnebago and Green Lake counties. However, uh, we do serve people from outside of those counties as well, because a lot of times it can be uh, too unsafe to stay within in your own county so people seek services a little bit further out. So we serve um, people from all over and um, of all genders and of all races and all socioeconomic statuses uh, because domestic abuse can happen to absolutely anybody. Domestic abuse does not discriminate. Um, our mission as an organization is to empower individuals and families through education, safety, and support and lead our community to reduce the incidents and the effects of dating violence. Everything that we do, every program we have, um, we are very mission driven and client focused. Um, and everything we do is in the for the best intentions of our clients. So again, our service area is Winnebago and Green Lake counties. Um, we have a 24 hour emergency shelter located in Oshkosh. It is a 37 bed facility, so 37 people can be staying at our organization at any given time. We have an outreach office in Menasha, located inside the Levin building, and an outreach office in Green Lake um, in the Town Square community building. Some programs that we offer is inclusive services, our 24-hour emergency shelter and helpline. Um, we have a whole team that's dedicated to working with youth who are impacted by domestic abuse, we have outreach services in Green Lake and Winnebago counties. So for the people who don't need the shelter, but they still need um, support options, resources um, from an advocate, they can meet with an advocate on an outreach basis without needing the shelter piece of it. We um, provide legal advocacy for individuals who are seeking information on restraining orders, harassment orders, divorces, custody cases, you name it. Uh, we're also able to go to court with our clients and help them navigate through that legal process. And then we have community education such as this, like what we're doing today. So um, what is domestic abuse? There is a misconception about domestic abuse, and um, oftentimes when people hear that word, they automatically think physical violence. Um, and although that is definitely a factor and um, a tactic that is used within domestic abuse, um, it is so much more than that. And a lot of times people, uh, when they hear domestic abuse, they assume it's just between intimate partners. However, um, domestic abuse is a systematic pattern of behaviors in any relationship that are used to gain and maintain power and control over another person. So it takes you from being equals in that relationship to now there's that imbalance and somebody has more control over what the other person does, who they hang out with, what they wear, who they talk to, etc. 
Um, and any relationship is a very key part in this uh, definition because it is not only between intimate partners, but it can be between um, a parent and child. It can be between roommates. It can be between um, a caregiver and the person that they're caring for. So there are a lot of different dynamics in which domestic abuse can be present, um, not only in intimate partner relationships. And there is no such thing as a typical victim. Um, abuse can happen to absolutely anyone, again, regardless of their gender, their age, their race, their sexual orientation, their socioeconomic status. Um, anybody can be impacted by domestic abuse. So domestic abuse is all about power and control. It is that constant need for um, from somebody to have control over that other person, controlling all the different dynamics that are happening within that relationship. So it is not about anger. It is not about mental illness. It is not about drugs or alcohol or about stress or because the victim did anything to cause it. Um, although these may be added layers in there um, in a person's situation, it all boils down to a choice that that unhealthy person is making to treat you in this abusive way. They don't treat everyone like this, right? So they don't treat um, the people in the grocery store like this, their friends. Um, they are choosing to treat you in this particular way, in this very unhealthy and abusive way. So power and control, um, we have our power and control wheel here, which is an incredibly helpful tool. Um, this is something that we utilize in every single facet of our organization, whether it's through community education pieces like this, um, when we're going into the schools and doing presentations for youth, and then also when we're meeting one-on-one -on -one with our clients, this is something that we use. Um, it is an extremely educational, an informational tool. Um, a lot of times people will come to us and think, you know, well, I'm, I'm not experiencing physical abuse. I don't even know if what I'm experiencing is abuse. Um, but I know I just want to talk to somebody and just kind of talk this through. And that's really where this wheel comes in, because this gives us the opportunity um, for them to read through and see all the different tactics that are used in an abusive relationship. And so many times, it never gets physical. Um, there are so many individuals that we work with who have never experienced physical violence and they may never will. Um, and there are a lot of individuals who, who are experiencing extreme emotional abuse, verbal abuse, psychological abuse. They may be experiencing technological abuse, right? All of those other different tactics that are used that are just, um, that make just as much of an impact as physical abuse does. Um, so we try to do as much education as possible. So I'm gonna go through and talk a little bit about each section on this power and control wheel. And um, as an agency, we've actually added a couple more sections into this wheel as um, the more we learn and the more dynamics and the things that we hear uh, from our clients. So um, this wheel has some, some added things in from, from our advocates perspective as well. So first one I wanna start out with is isolation. And isolation is, it's really where domestic abuse starts. And it's a very gradual process because domestic abuse, um, thrives in isolation. And that's where kind of COVID, uh, the dynamics of COVID and the safer at home order and isolation and power and control was kind of the perfect storm um, for really bad situations to happen. And so um, isolation could be physical isolation of like moving you to a different city or different state away from your support system, away from your family, away from your friends. So the only person that you really have to rely on is that partner of yours or that abusive person in your life. Um, and again, it starts out very gradual. So for an example, say I'm in a relationship with somebody and um, I'm meeting his friends for the very first time. And say his friend, Dan, 
kind of looks at me funny or like makes a like trying to joke with me like makes a comment but i take it in a very negative way you know i might play it off like everything's fine and that like oh you know i'm having a great time but then as soon as we leave I'm going to pick a huge fight with my partner and be like, did you see the way that Dan was looking at me or us or he clearly does not approve of our relationship and I'm going to cause this big scene about Dan. And so what's going to happen is the next time that we hang out with my partner's friends, Dan probably isn't going to be invited because he knows that I really don't like Dan and Dan um, insulted me in some or in some capacity offended me. And so I don't want to be around Dan because now Dan is an issue. Dan is a problem. And so that will then start to continue with more friends and more family members um, until really it may just be you. And for your own safety, isolation um, is the only thing that can keep you safe. Because if you try to hang out with your friend Dan, I'm going to cause a huge scene and I'm going to get really upset. And so that's something that abusive individuals thrive on is isolating you from other people in your life and those support systems that you have. Um, then I'm going to move on to technological abuse. So this could be monitoring somebody's communication, monitoring their mileage on their vehicle, um, having their location. Um, you know, there are apps like Snapchat where you can have your location on all the time. Um, it could be monitoring through that. It could also be putting um, mon monitoring software on your phone, on your vehicle, different ways to just kind of keep track and tabs on you. Um, technological abuse could also be sending unwanted text messages or pressuring a person to look at, take, or send sexual photos. Um, it could be breaking into a person's social network profiles, emails, cell phones, demanding passwords to your phone, to your social networks, etc. Um, next, I want to talk about spiritual or cultural abuse. And so this could be putting somebody down because of one's um, religious beliefs or culture. It could be isolating a person from their community. Um, using beliefs to a person's advantage or as an excuse for abuse. Uh, this could be like using religious scripture as um, as reason for why they're doing what they're doing to you because the Bible says this um, or or etc. Um, it could be forcing a person to adopt a specific mindset. So it could be forcing that other person to believe what you believe. Um, that their beliefs are wrong and that they're incorrect and you have to start believing this. Um, emotional abuse is constantly putting somebody down by calling them names, swearing at them, yelling, insulting, using sarcasm, being condescending. Um, it could be constantly making somebody feel insecure or guilty, telling somebody that they're crazy or playing mind games on them. Um, it could be gaslighting or using humiliation and guilt as a form of control. So how this could sound is, I never said that. You're lying. You're making that up. I never said that. Another, um, another tactic used is intimidation, threats, and coercion. So making another person afraid by using looks, gestures, phrases, and just how they carry themselves. So this could be like punching the wall right next to you. So they're not physically harming you, but they're scaring you enough to say like, this could have been you. Um, this could be displaying weapons. So like on the nightstand, having a weapon there, never actually threatening to use it on you, but just having it present is intimidating enough and fearful enough. Um, it could be making or carrying out threats to do something to hurt someone or to hurt themselves you hear a lot um, where if you leave me i'm going to i'm going to hurt myself i'm going to harm myself whatever that may look like and so it makes you feel like you need to stay in that relationship otherwise you may feel responsible for if that person harms themselves or hurts themselves and that's purposeful uh, then we have health and bodily autonomy abuse. So this could be preventing a person from receiving proper medical care. Um, this could be not allowing a person to choose what happens to their body reproductively. 
Um, it could be inhibiting a person from obtaining what they need to perform normal tasks throughout the day or not allowing a person to make their own decisions. So this could sound like I'm coming to your appointment no matter what, or I don't want you on birth control, or there's nothing wrong with you. You don't need to go see a doctor. You're making it up. Um, special privilege could be treating the other person as unimportant or insignificant. Um, their opinion doesn't weigh as much as the other person's. Uh, always being right and forcing the other person to adopt or accept their way of thinking. So this is kind of the my way or the highway sort of scenarios. It could be um, reinforcing traditional gender roles, manipulating information, and then also just double standards. Well, I can do that, but you can't. Um, then we'll go to economic abuse. So economic abuse is preventing someone from keeping or getting a job or forcing a person into a job that they're unable to work. It could be making a person ask or beg for money or live on an allowance. Forcing the other person to hand over their paycheck. So you could be working 40 plus hours a week and not see a dime of that paycheck and maybe only given an allowance of what of the money that you are working very hard to earn. It could be um, not sharing any access to the family income or knowing how much debt the family is in. It could also look like the person taking out credit cards in your name and um, like maxing out all your credit cards and not paying on them and ruining your credit. Um, it could also look like not paying child support as well. So this could sound like I make all the money in this house, so you have to do what I say. Um, you, it could sound like I don't have to pay for that. We need to share all the finances or I'm not putting your name on that um, and vice versa. Using children, pets or property. So this could be like alienate, alienating a parent into making them feel guilty about their children, um, using children to monitor a person's activity, putting the children in the middle and making them kind of spy on the other parent for that abusive parent. It could be using visitation as leverage or as an opportunity to harass that other person. Um, it could be abusing children or threatening to harm or take away children or using children to relay messages. You tell your dad this, or you tell your mom this um, in a really harmful way. It could also be like abusing pets or threatening to, to harm pets, um, which is also a reason why people usually will stay in this environment because they're afraid if they leave and they're unable to take their animals with that, um, that their animals are gonna be harmed in that process. And then also using property, which I kind of talked about a little bit before in intimidation and threats, but punching walls or doors, smashing or stealing or destroying property, throwing objects, um, minimizing, denying, and blaming is, um, so minimizing the abuse would be like, I barely even touched you, get over it, um, you're overreacting, and sometimes it looks like denying the abuse ever happened to begin with. I never did that. You're lying. Like, I never touched you. Um, or blaming. So it could be blaming the other person for their abusive behaviors. Um, if you would have just come home on time, I wouldn't have had to hit you or whatever the scenario may be. So placing blame on that other person and blaming that person for their actions and why that's happening. So um, domestic abuse is oftentimes a cycle. And there are different stages that play into this cycle. And what that can look like is any relationship, no matter what type of relationship it is, oftentimes will start out in the honeymoon phase or also known as the calm phase. And um, this is where you're just getting to know someone, you're finding out their likes, their dislikes, there may be a physical attraction to this person. Um, it's really great and fun and um, kind of that like stereotypical, like I'm experiencing the butterflies, like that sort of scenario. But with any normal relationship comes tension. 
And it is how you handle that tension and deal with that tension is what will make a healthy or an unhealthy relationship. So when tension happens in a healthy relationship, usually together you will problem solve to attack the problem. Um, you'll figure out what the problem is and use your problem solving skills to come to a conclusion together. In an unhealthy relationship, the focus is on the person rather than the problem itself. So all of the blame of why this problem is happening is because of one specific person. And oftentimes then that tension will lead to an act of abuse any of the, the tactics that we just talked about in that power and control wheel. And then almost always following that act of abuse comes the honeymoon phase again, or that calm phase, where um, it's a lot of apologies. It's, it could be tears. It could be promises to change. I promise I'm never going to treat you like that again. Um, it could be gifts, buying flowers, buying whatever that may look like to try and get that person back or to think, um, you know, that everything's going to be okay again and that you're not going to do this again. But then often what will happen is that tension will happen again and then that act of abuse will happen. And the longer that somebody stays within this unhealthy or this abusive relationship, the shorter and shorter the honeymoon or calm phase becomes and the faster people will travel through this cycle. So sometimes it will go from being like someone will go through this cycle in a month's time or like say six or seven months. Um, and there are some people that go through, rotate through this cycle multiple times a day. So the longer that you're in this abusive or unhealthy relationship, the quicker you will start to travel through this cycle. And there are three things that will keep somebody living within this cycle. And those are the three things in the middle here. And that is love, hope, and fear. So love, um, you may love this person. This could be someone that you've been married to for 20 years. This could be your parent. This could be your child. Um, there are a lot of different dynamics in which love could be present. And and then also hope. You hope that when they say, I am never going to treat you like this again, I will never hurt you again. You hope that they're going to stick to their word and that they're going to go back to how the relationship was when you first started dating. And then fear, um, fear of the unknown, fear of what is going to happen to me if I leave, um, fear of am I going to be able to afford living on my own if there's children involved that's another layer as well what's going to happen to the children if i leave um so there are a lot of different dynamics that play into this but love hope and fear are often the three things that keep somebody traveling and staying within this cycle and then um i hope this works <laughs> But I don't always have the best luck with videos and presentations. So I hope you all can hear this. Please let me know if you cannot. But I want to chat a little bit about gaslighting. And I think this video does a great job of kind of breaking down the different dynamics of gaslighting and what that looks like. But gaslighting is a form of psychological manipulation in which a person seeks um, to plant the seed of doubt in that other person. So it could be like, no, I told you that this was happening and they never told you that it was happening. Um, gaslighting you and making you think that they told you something that they never told you um, could be an example of that. Another example of gaslighting could be, um, I'll share a specific example of what we had, a client experience of ours. There was an individual who lived, lived their life by their Google Calendar. Any appointments they had um, were in their Google Calendar. And like most of you, you probably have some sort of a calendar or planner of sorts. Um, but this individual was showing up late to their appointments or showing up on the wrong day. And what was happening was this person's abusive partner had access to that Google Calendar and was going in and slightly changing the dates or the times of these appointments. And then what this person was doing was reiterating the fact that you can't even take care of yourself. You can't even show up to appointments on time. How do you expect to, like, you obviously need me. And so it was a form of gaslighting and manipulation in a way that made that person think like, oh my goodness, am I going crazy? Like, 
is something wrong with me and it makes you question your own reality. So I'm going to I'm going to try to play this video. Um, if it does not work, then we will just skip it. But if someone could just let me know if they can hear the video. We're good. To gaslight someone means to manipulate a person into questioning their own sanity. This is. Can anyone hear it? Yes. Okay, beautiful. Seen in abusive relationships, and even after the relationship ends, the effects of gaslighting can still progress. Consequently, it is important to identify such a relationship as soon as possible. Get rid of gaslighters from your life and keep them away from contact for at least a year, if not permanently. Gaslighting is a form of emotional abuse that gives the abuser power to make the victim question their own mentalities. Here are 10 signs to help you identify if you are being gaslighted in an abusive relationship. One, using your fears. Abusive people often act charming in order to extract information from you and use it against you later on. They take note of your vulnerabilities, especially for this reason. The abuser will want to feel like they're better than you and make sure you think that way too. For example, if you have weight insecurities, the abuser will poke fun of your weight and constantly point out people who are skinnier than you. Two, knowing you. Many abusers think and act as if they know everything about you, right down to your thoughts. If you try to claim otherwise, they will assume you're lying. They may even try to convince you that you're lying to yourself. Three, normal changes. This is one of the most obvious signs of gaslighting. If someone tries to tell you something is normal when you think it's wrong, you need to get out of that relationship. For example, if you don't want to take the next step in a relationship, but your partner calls you a prude rather than accepting your comfort levels, you should watch out. Keep in mind, abusers do not exist only in romantic relationships, but in professional relationships as well. Four, questioning your sanity. A person is abusing you, and yet you're the one that's insane? That's basically how it goes in the mind of an abuser. When an abuser does not get their way, even through manipulation, they may become more intense by questioning your sanity. You're likely to be called paranoid, hormonal, or overly sensitive. Five, making you doubt yourself. When someone says something over and over again, you are bound to believe it eventually. Because of frequent exposure to such comments, you will find yourself questioning your own judgment and may eventually give up completely and just let the other person think for you. Six, forgetting. An abuser tends to have selective memory where they may deny ever saying anything that upset you if you try to confront them about it. For example, they may have made a promise that was never fulfilled and then claim the promise was never made. Seven, making you lie. You may not usually lie, but this person may cause you to lie at times to avoid any verbal and or physical abuse to come. This lying is motivated by stress caused by the abuser. Eight, causing you to stay silent. It is innate for humans to want to share their experiences, but being with an abuser may redirect that nature. You may avoid or stop talking with the abuser and may even stop talking about yourself and your experiences to everyone in general based off habit and trauma caused by the abuser. Nine, making you question your sanity. Manipulative tactics can change the way people think drastically. When you are constantly trying to end an argument with an abuser, it may become easy to just go along with whatever the person is saying, but this slowly changes the way you think. You eventually start believing the abuser when they say you are in the wrong and should apologize. 10, making you depressed. Being worn down by an abuser can easily make anyone depressed. 
being pushed to question yourself and your sanity will get tiring over time and eventually lead to a feeling of hopelessness. Worst of all, because you think you have issues such as paranoia and memory loss, you are likely to search for treatment for the depression and the mental problems rather than for the issue itself, the abuser. Now that you know some of the gaslighting signs, do you think you've ever been gaslighted before? If so, how did you get out of that relationship? So this, I love this video because I think it breaks down many different elements of gaslighting. Um, and the more you learn about it, the more you're able to recognize um, when this is being, when this is taking place. If you enjoyed this video, Oops. be sure to follow our other social. Okay. So um, as people are living within this abusive relationship, um, it's really easy from an, out, from an outside perspective to say, why don't you just leave? Like, get out of there. Why don't you just leave? But there are so many barriers um, and things that keep somebody living within this relationship. And so um, people may, a barrier that people may experience is they may have no support from friends or family members. Um, they may fear cultural community or societal backlash. They may feel that they have nowhere to go or no ability to get there. So say they live out in the middle of nowhere, have no, um, we're never allowed to get a driver's license or not allowed to drive a vehicle or don't have a vehicle. Um, it's another barrier that they may experience and that uh, hinders their ability to leave. They may fear that they won't be able to support themselves or if there's children involved, support their children. Um, they may have children in common and fear for their safety. They have pets or other animals that they don't wanna leave behind. They may be distrustful of local law enforcement, courts, or other systems, and just previous unsupportive experiences that they've had with friends, family members, employers, law enforcement, CPS, et cetera. Um, and something I will note is when somebody is leaving a relationship or has just left, that is the most dangerous time in an abusive relationship. That is oftentimes when the abusive person feels a loss of control, which again, abuse and um, domestic abuse is all about having that power and control. So the moment that somebody is taking the autonomy and saying, I am leaving, I am getting myself out of this, it's a loss of control from that abusive person's perspective. And that's oftentimes when they're going to escalate. And um, this is when you're gonna see more physical acts of violence and more homicides take place. Some important things to note is that domestic abuse usually escalates over time. Um, there are many things that can indicate danger. So once the survivor starts to think about leaving or does leave the relationship, that's very dangerous. Um, if the abusive person has access to guns, that is very dangerous. And then also if depression or suicidal threats are made by the abusive person, that's oftentimes um, that will indicate very dangerous situations. And on average, um, a person will leave an average of seven times before they permanently leave. Um, at Christine Ann, we provide non-judgmental services and um, we always wanna be that safe and supportive place and people for them. So even if um, this is their, sec their first time coming to us or this is their fourth, fifth, 15th time where they've left our agency, went back and have come back to us. We are always going to be here to be that safe and supportive person in place for that individual so that they know that no matter how hard it gets or how unsafe it gets, that they have a safe place in the community that they can stay. So some warning signs to look for would be um, if an individual mentions not being able to use the phone, um, if there, if you have a lot of like after hours gatherings with your friends um, and this person is never allowed to come unless their partner is along or unless another person is with them, 
Um, it could be a change in demeanor, constantly taking blame and apologizing for situations, even if they have nothing to do with it or it was not their, um, not their fault at all. They may be taking blame or apologizing for those things. Um, it could be forbidden from seeing friends unless that abusive person is along. Um, the abusive person has exclusive control over all the money and household financial matters. They won't let their partner go to school, get a job, learn to drive. The abusive person um, threatens to hurt themselves if the, if the other person attempts to leave the relationship. The abusive person blames the victims for their, um, for their abusive behaviors. And the abusive person is overly jealous and constantly accusing that other person of cheating. So those are some different warning signs. Um, some abusive characteristics could be cruelty to animals or children, verbal abuse, making you question your own perception and reality, being um, abusive in past relationships, threats of violence, breaking or striping, striking any objects, any sort of force during an argument, jealousy, Quick involvement, which means, um, you know, if anyone's starting to question that something's going on, they're going to be super quick to get involved and, and try to squash that right away so that people aren't getting involved in, in that relationship. Having unrealistic expectations so that you can never um, meet those expectations and there's always something for them to be upset with you about. Being incredibly uh, sensitive or hypersensitivity. Controlling behaviors isolation, um, blames others for their problems and feelings. And then um, this last one's important. This is they tend to wear a good mask so that some signs may not be seen, right? When you first meet someone, all of these things usually are not happening on your first date. And if they are, you are probably not going to have a second date with that person, or you may even cut that date short. Um, but also as time moves on, right? There are people in the community or different people in your social circles who know both of you um, don't necessarily know that this is going on behind closed doors. And they may think that that abusive person is an incredible person, right? They're super nice. They're really charming. They've been nothing but kind. And so there's no way that they could do that. But they tend to wear a good mask to people outside of that relationship and mask what's actually happening and who they truly are as a person. But now I want to talk about healthy relationships. Um, I think it's important to understand what an unhealthy relationship looks like so that um, you have the tools to understand uh, if any of those tactics are being used, like, hey, this is not very healthy. So um, I usually always start out with just talking about the unhealthy characteristics of a relationship. But to counter that, I think it's very important to talk about the healthy relationships. So this is where I would love some participation. Um, and so for this time, you can unmute yourself if you have anything that you'd love to add to this. But um, think about a relationship that you have in your life that you think is a healthy one. Um, so take a minute, identify that relationship. Um, is it with a family member? Is it with a, a best friend? Is it with an intimate partner that you have, et cetera? So what are some things that you see? What are some things that you hear? And what are some things that you feel within that healthy relationship? So that, does anyone wanna share? I'll, I'll share something. Yeah. So I know that one big thing for me that I noticed like when I compare my good my or my healthy to unhealthy relationships is when I maybe share a negative experience I've had in the past or or something that maybe someone else might judge me on the, the healthy relationship never brings that back to like hurt me with later absolutely yeah they don't they don't bring they don't full circle that in a like, well, you did this in a previous relationship, so you're going to do it again. Yeah, that's a great, um, that's a great example. 
What are some other things that we hear in a healthy relationship? Maybe just like general communication, right? Um, nothing is off the table. You're able to communicate your thoughts, your feelings, even if they're not so great. Um, it could be your problems that you're experiencing um, or some concerns that you're having about your relationship. Um, but having an open and honest communication and with that other person where they're not using that against you and where they're not... Um, saying, well, I do that because you do this, right? That healthy relationship, you're, you're breaking that down and you're talking about that together and you're problem solving. Um, in a healthy relationship, you may hear people complimenting one another, um, asking how you are and genuinely caring. It could also be, um, you know, there's a lot of laughter and love within healthy relationships. Some things that you could see would be um, smiling, having fun together, showing concern for one another and genuine concern. Um, and then how you feel. So does anyone want to share, like, what are some things that you feel in that healthy relationship that you're thinking about, whether it's with your sibling, whether it's with your parent or your significant other, what are some things that you feel in that relationship? In the chat, there was some uh, sharing happening. So there's overall trust, constant support. Uh, for me, in a, in a healthy relationship, my other significant other is always supportive of me. People in a healthy relationship should be happy for you about your accomplishments. People in negative relationships try to bring you down or make you feel bad. I think you should feel loved and important. And I feel safe and loved. I love all of those. I'm sorry, I forgot to check the chat feature. <laughs> um, yes, those are all great examples of a healthy relationship. And again, so in that last one that, that somebody mentioned, I feel safe and loved. You deserve to feel safe in your relationships, no matter what they are. Um, if you ever have a time when you feel unsafe in your relationship, that's a great indicator that, hey, this may not be the healthiest relationship. But some things that you feel in these healthy relationships is feeling safe, feeling loved, feeling trusted, cared for, um, and worry-free. And relationships are necessary and important part of all of our lives. They provide us with a sense of belonging and support. And, um, but relationships also take a lot of work. And we're not born with the skills to have a healthy relationship. And these are learned skills and behaviors by watching others and through practice in our own relationships. So like the power and control wheel, we also have a respect and safety. This is not in the form of a wheel. We do have a wheel one, but um, so these are some things that no matter what, you deserve respect and to feel safe in your relationships. So like the power and control wheel, how it had all of these different tactics that are used in an unhealthy way, we're gonna go through and talk about how these are used in a healthy way. So trust and support, valuing the other person's right to have friends, feelings, activities, and opinions, and outside of just the two of you. Understanding that a person's interest um, in others does not mean a lack of interest in you. Showing concern for the other person's physical and emotional boundaries and desires. And supporting the other person's freedom, identity, confidence, and life goals. Uh, communication is a huge factor in um, a healthy relationship. And that is speaking and acting in a way that makes other, the other person feel safe. Um, expressing thoughts and feelings, communicating openly and listening to the other person without judgment. Um, this is abiding by the mutual set boundaries in that relationship. Boundaries are super important in a healthy relationship. And we'll talk about boundaries next. But um, but express, expressing how you want to be treated. You know, there's a golden rule of treat others how you want to be treated. 
but I think it's important that treat others how they want to be treated. Um, honesty and accountability are also big factors in a healthy relationship. So being truthful, being trustful, and um, even though it, not, it may not be an easy thing to do, being truthful is so important. Accepting responsibility for your own actions. So if you hurt somebody's feelings, um, taking responsibility for that and apologizing for that. Being able to admit when you're wrong, um, which is hard, but important. And acknowledging responsibility for one's own health and happiness. You are responsible for your own health and happiness. Um, Negotiation and fairness is also another important piece in a healthy relationship. So seeking mutually satisfying resolutions to conflict. So again, that's using your problem solving skills together, putting your heads together to um, attack the problem itself rather than the person. And using positive language to express opinions, not putting a person down, but building them up and lifting them up allowing differences of opinions. You may not always agree on everything and that's okay. Being willing to compromise. Um, financial respect is having, um, having a legal income, making financial decisions together, not um, you know, spending your, your mutual money all in one place without any sort of conversation without that other person. So communicating that is important making sure that both people benefit from making financial arrangements and staying up to date and open about financial payments and debt. Um, children and how that can be in a, in a respectful or healthy relationship is being a positive nonviolent role model for children, supporting a person in their parenting role, respecting a safe person's parenting style, Co-parenting without hostile, controlling, and harassing behaviors. Social or technological and how that can be used in a healthy relationship is respecting people's privacy on social media and boundaries regarding text messaging, calling, um, sending photos, videos, only with permission. Paying attention to the person even when their friends are around. Going to places and activity um, enjoyed by both people and not always just doing what you want to do, but also making sure that you're both enjoying those activities. And giving as much as you're receiving. That's also very important. Equality. So at the very beginning, we talked about how power and control is that imbalance and equality in that relationship. So in a healthy relationship, you are equal partners in that. Um, you acknowledge your right and the rights of others. You value the other person's opinions and thoughts. You have a, that balance of giving and receiving. Um, sharing decision-making and influence in the relationship and also respecting the person's right to say no. It's very important. Spiritual and cultural, um, learning about a person's beliefs, practices, customs, cultures, traditions, um, encouraging a person's involvement in their community throughout those communities and respecting a person, person's religious or spiritual beliefs, texts, practices, even if they differ from your own. Pets and property, so respecting a person's boundary with their pets and property. Treat a pet as a, as a very valuable element um, to that person and not just as a tool for control. Supporting a person's decision to own and care for an animal. And then tr um, trust and support. Did we start there? I think we did. Um, yeah, valuing the other person's right to have feelings, friends, and activities and opinions outside from yourself. So these are all super valuable, super important things that make up a healthy relationship. So these, these tools, um, and this can be found on our website at christinan.net, um, along with the power and control one. Um, so if you need those, I can also send them out to Alicia after the fact as well. Um, but it's a great tool to use, and it's a great reminder to look at these or even go through um, to go through this with your partner and make sure that you know you do feel respected and that they also feel respected.
So next, so I talked about healthy boundaries um, because boundaries are so, so, so important um, in a healthy relationship. Uh, setting boundaries is not a negative thing. It's really important and it can be viewed as a positive thing so that if your boundaries are crossed, you're able to have a healthy communication and conversation about that. So, but it's important to know um, what boundaries are and what your limits are. So before becoming involved in a situation, know what is acceptable to you and what is not acceptable to you. Um, it's best to be as specific as possible, or you might be pulled too far into the trap of giving just a little bit more, a little bit more, and a little bit more, more until you've given far too much. Know your values. So every person's limits are very different. Everyone has different boundaries. And um, everybody has that line set at a different place. So it's super important to know where that line is. Um, so a person's limits are different and they're often determined by their personal values. So for example, if you value family above all else, this may lead you to have stricter limits on how late you're gonna stay at school or at work away from your family. So know what's important to you and protect that. Listen to your emotions. So if you notice that feelings of discomfort or resentment are happening, do not bury them. Try to understand what your feelings are telling you. So for example, resentment um, can often be traced to feelings of being taken advantage of. Having self-respect. So if you always give in to others, ask yourself if you're showing just as much respect to you as you are to that other person. Boundaries are um, boundaries that are too open, maybe due to misguided attempts to be liked or um, constantly needing for that other person's approval. So you give more of yourself to that relationship, but in return, you're not necessarily respecting what you need in that relationship. And then also having respect for others. So be sure that your actions are not self-serving and or at the expense of other people. Um, interactions should not all be about winning or taking as much as possible. Instead, consider what's fair to everyone. And given the setting in the relationship, you might win, but at what cost? Be assertive. So when you know it's time to set a boundary, don't be shy. Um, say no respectfully. Um, if you can make a compromise while still respecting your own boundaries, try it, do it. That's a good way to soften the no, um, while also showing respect to every person that's involved. And then also consider the long view. So some days you will give more than you take, and other days you will take more than you give. But be willing to take a longer view of relationships and look at that in a spectrum when appropriate. But if you're always the one who's giving, or if you are always the one who's taking, there might be a problem there. And then ways to help. So if any of these things that we talked about sound familiar um, to maybe not you, but somebody who's in your life and your social circles and your family, et cetera, there are ways that you can help. And so I consider this the three R's, recognize, respond, and refer. So recognize the warning signs of abuse, the things that we learned today excuse me, respond to the behaviors in a supportive and non-judgmental way. So if somebody confides in you and tells you what's going on, you want to support that person, you want to validate them, and you don't want to judge them. And then refer them. So you may not have the resources and tools to help pr provide support for that person, but there are community agencies that can. So know the resources. And that way you're able to refer them to different agencies that can help beyond the point that you can. Some helpful statements are, you do not deserve to be treated like this. I'm concerned for your safety. I'm concerned for your children's safety. How can I help you stay safe? What do you need from me? I believe you. This is not your fault. 
I'm here for you and you are not alone. Um, this can be a really daunting topic to talk about. And if somebody confides in you that um, they're in an unhealthy or in an abusive relationship, these are statements that are very important to say um, so that this individual feels validated and supported. Um, the last thing you wanna do is fire off a hundred questions um, but instead validate that person's feelings and make sure that they know that what they're experiencing is not their fault. Because a lot of times people will internalize the abuse and think that it's happening because of something that they did or um, take a lot of blame and guilt and blame themselves for I should have left earlier or I should have done this when I saw it happen. So they take a lot of blame and guilt. And so it's important to remember to say to that person that it is not their fault and they did nothing to deserve this. So what can we do? We wanna end the cycle of abuse, right? Um, so be mindful of your actions and behaviors, treat others with respect, promote healthy relationships, refuse to be a bystander. This does not mean that if you actively see physical violence, physical violence happening in front of you that you need to get involved in that. That is not what I'm saying. Um, we want everyone to be as safe as possible. And if, that, if that's gonna put you in an unsafe situation, do not do that. Instead, call the police, call 911. Don't think like, ooh, I'm just gonna mind my own business and somebody else will probably call. Be that person, make that call. What can you do for a friend? You can offer yourself as a safe person and if possible, a safe place that they can stay if you have that space and ability to do so. Don't further isolate them through judgment, lack of support, or telling them what they need to do and when they need to do it. They are the experts of their own lives. And so you need to respect their timing because again, um, by just thinking like, oh my God, you need to leave, you need to get out of there right now, that may not be the safest option at that point. And even if they're not willing to accept the help that you're giving, just keep the door open so that when they are ready, so are you. And um, what it's doing is it's planting the seed. So it's important to say what you see and to be incredibly factual about it. Like, hey, I noticed that when you were on the phone, um, X, Y, and Z happened. Is everything okay? Is there anything that you wanna talk about? Do you feel safe? Um, don't be afraid to have those conversations because what you're doing is you're planting that seed of like, is everything all right? I'm concerned for what I'm seeing. And even if they are not receptive to that situation, they know that down the line when maybe they are receptive and willing to talk about that, they know that you're a safe person that they can go to. So don't be afraid to plant that seed. Don't be afraid to say something and say what you see. And then I want to leave you with this, because I think this is super important. Um, no matter where you are in the state of Wisconsin, there is a helping agency regarding domestic abuse um, for every single county in the state of Wisconsin. There may not be a shelter in every city, but every county has a helping agency. So this graphic can be found on End Abuse Wisconsin um, on their website. And... It has all of the helpline numbers. It has what um, county they serve. So this is a really important graphic. Um, something to kind of keep in mind for that refer piece for, um, you know, you're all at UW Oshkosh right now, but say you move to other cities throughout, uh, like after you graduate, or maybe you're in other cities right now. It's important to know the resources that are in your area so that even if it never, even if it's not a number that you personally need, it's something that you're able to give to somebody else in your social circles who may need it. And then this is our um, helpline number. We have advocates staffed 24 seven. And this is not just for people who are experiencing domestic abuse, but this is also for friends or family members who are impacted um, as well and who just wanna learn and help and know the best ways that they can help support that person in their life who is experiencing this. So this is our helpline number. Um, help is always available at Christine Ann. All right, so I um, would love to open it up if we have any questions. 
I don't know how to stop sharing. Oh, there we go. Does anyone have any questions at all for me? I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and then we can continue into the Q&A. Sure.